Another big announcement for Total War is in the history books, and already The Hunter and the Beast has shot itself straight to the top of the global bestsellers list on Steam. Clever girl. But the news keeps rolling in with Gorok the Great White Lizard, confirmed as the Free Lord, coming with the update. Start positions for Marcus Wolfhart and Nakai the Wanderer, a glimpse at their skill trees, and a complete overhaul to the Empire campaign, a long-awaited one. We'll talk about Gorok when he materializes early next week, but for now, let's skip the BS and get right into the news. And we'll start with Nakai the Wanderer, who will begin his Eye of the Vortex campaign in the Creeping Jungle, just south of Marcus Wolfhart on the Scorpion Coast. Now, this is a bit of a precarious position, especially for a Horde faction, because you're deep in the heartlands of the free-for-all that is Lustria. And unlike in the lore, where Lustria is without a shadow of a doubt a Lizardman Bastion through and through, the Skaven, the Dark Elves, and the Vampire Coast are all much bigger threats in Total War Warhammer's campaign. So the fact that you're smack dab in the middle of all that, that free-for-all, could get just a teeny bit scary. Remember, if your initial horde goes extinct, so does your campaign. But you're probably going to have some pretty powerful stuff from the outset to get you off the ground. One of the screenshots we've seen already, that was released today, appears to show his starting army with Sacred Croxagors, the new kids on the block with the shiny gold power fists and dual-wielding shenanigans. And the Kai himself, well, it's probably a beat stick from level 1, so the battles themselves shouldn't be too much of an issue. It's more about positioning when you're talking about horde gameplay. What should get a lot of people excited, though, is his Mortal Empires campaign start, all the way in Albion, off the coast of Norska. Now, this is a really nice throwback to the Shadows Over Albion campaign, where he and Mazdamundi plunged into the Misty Isles there and forged a new temple city called Conquana. Like much of Nakai's lore, though, and the fact that the mark of the old ones he was spawned with meant he was albino back in 6th edition, this entire section of lore around Albion appears to have been retconned over the years, but at the very least, CA is at least referencing that particular tabletop campaign, which is pretty cool. And it is a great start position for a horde faction, especially for the lizards, because they really needed a change in scenery. They've been in the deserts, they've been in the jungle since Total War Warhammer 2 was first announced. To be in the snowy, misty isles up north will be a pretty great start, so I'm pretty hype about that. I imagine he'll be doing a lot of chaos killing in my first playthrough, and in a head-to-head -head campaign, him against Wolfric or Throg would be very thematic and a lot of fun. And as we talked about yesterday, he's got unique horde mechanics, gifts conquered settlements to vassals, and he has a heavy emphasis on Croxcore lords and units, which is kind of what we were expecting from the beginning. I also like the fact that the Dread Saurian itself kind of has a crocodilian aesthetic going on. It's not quite like what we saw from the tabletop, but it looks amazing regardless, and I think that it's going to be a really, really cool unit. He gives all Kraxagor's frenzy and makes them faster, which is disgustingly good, can become unbreakable, has two quest items, including the Agam Shard, which is yet another nod to the Shadows over Albion campaign, and appears to get bonuses for killing off each of the four famous hunters that Marcus Wolfhart will try and recruit. Now on top of that, the regions he captures can be dedicated to one of three separate old ones. Quetzal the Warrior, Zolanka the Lost, whose protege Chikata of the Slan purged the entire Southlands of Demons in a Deliverance of Itza type spell, and Itzel the Three-Horned Beast. Itzel appears to summon Razor Dons and buff Kraxagors in an army-wide kind of buff, but beyond that, we don't know really how all of that's going to work, other than you will capture a settlement, you will dedicate it to a particular old one, and then your vassal, the defenders of the old ones, will then capture the settlements and take control of it while you go gallivant off somewhere else. Now for Marcus Wolfhart, the Hunts Marshal, you'll be starting on the Scorpion Coast in Northern Lustria, Stone's Throw from Skeggy, Mazda Mundi, and Luther Harkin. For Mortal Empires, mostly the same, but it's the Creeping Jungle instead, so just moving a little bit further west. The Temple of Tlenkon is a long-lost temple city raised to ruin during the Great Catastrophe, and it will be your base of operations. Simply from a head-to-head -head campaign perspective, I feel like in most situations, this rivalry is going to be over super quick. I mean, in the Vortex campaign, both factions are right on top of each other, and whoever wins that first battle probably outright takes the W might not actually make for the most interesting head-to-head -head playthrough. What should be interesting, though, is taking a bunch of mortal men, putting them in a position to colonize a continent that will rise up to eat you, literally, and take on the Jurassic Jungles with faith, steel, and gunpowder. Despite how amazing these Sacred Kraxagors and Dread Saurians look, 
I'll venture to guess that significantly more players will start with Wolfheart and the Empire on September 11th. Simply because a lot of Game 2 owners have probably never gotten the chance to play the Empire before, don't own Game 1, so for them it's going to feel like a whole new race because it pretty much is, and it's going to feel like a whole new game. So I personally think the Lizardmen look cooler in this update, but the Empire is going to be newer content for a lot of the people that are now playing Mortal Empires or the Vortex campaign for the first time with the Empire. It appears we have gotten confirmation that the entire roster will be limited at the start of his expedition, not just the ROWs and special units, but pretty much his entire roster, but as reinforcements trickle in through supplies and the Imperial Mandate mechanic, you will be gifted better and better stuff as you expand. Kind of feels a bit like the Crusade mechanic similar to the Teutonic campaign from Medieval Two Kingdoms, with the French and English and Holy Roman Empire sending all their nobles over so they could get a taste of some pagan blood alongside the Teutons. Same thing here, only this time it's skyscraper-sized dinosaurs trying to eat you instead of pagans trying to murder you. So hold on to your butts, it's gonna get crazy. Now Wolfheart has one quest item, the Amber Bow, a double shot buff for Huntsmen that will turn them into better versions of Deepwood Scouts, allowing them to fire off two projectiles of volley, armor sundering attacks for himself, vanguard deployment for his entire army, which while thematic is just kind of being given out like candy at this point, so I'm kind of like, meh. It's fun, but it doesn't need to be on every lord in the game, and it kind of feels like that's where we're headed at this point. And big buffs to Huntsmen and Huntsmen Generals, as we were expecting. Looks like Archers, Huntsmen, and a War Wagon will be your additional starting units as well. But that is hardly the only content addition the Empire are getting in this update. Long have we waited, and finally, another Old World race is getting some long-deserved lovin'. For one, the map itself is getting reworked quite tremendously, in fact, especially when we're talking about the Empire Regents. The Moot is getting its own province, Halflings confirmed, pretty awesome there, and Solid is getting added to the southeast of Null. Now, 800 years ago, Gorbad Ironclaw, one of the biggest and baddest and meanest and greenest orc war bosses of all time, maybe the baddest, rampaged all through the area and ripped the southernmost Empire province out from the bedrock leaving it a smoldering ruin. The Reichsmarschall Kurt Helborg now wields the Solon Rune Fang that was left over from that disaster, and it looks like Karl Franz is trying to reinvigorate the Imperial territory down there in the south as he summons the Electrocouts. More on that in a moment, but Balthazar Gelt will be moving to Solon with a new star position and a new sub-faction called the Golden Order, finally opening up some co-op campaign compatibility for those of you who like Faith, Steel, and Gunpowder on the front line against Chaos. Now, from a lore perspective, does that really make that much sense? No. Gelt is one of those lords who probably should be starting in Altdorf in the Imperial Colleges of Magic, but I'm okay with it simply because new star positions and just co-op compatibility are ultimately more important, and they've been begging for more star positions for a very, very long time. So I'm a-okay with that, and the Golden Order sounds like a amazing faction name, so I will definitely be giving that one a shot. And finally, the Empire office system. Long given to everyone and their mother and brother, long outdated at this point, is being replaced by an Electric Counts mechanic, which lets you, well, summon the Electric Counts. The meme is no longer a dream, it will be real life. And basically what it lets you do is confederate other provinces without going to war is kind of a big deal when you're trying to unify the Empire and not raise it to ashes. We got a glimpse of this on Twitter and Facebook yesterday alongside the newly added Rune Fangs and a huge hint at how the new Regiments of Renown will work as well. And this is big. All of it is big. The idea that you previously had to just ransack your way through Imperial territory to bring the other Electric Counts into line was kind of preposterous. Completely antithetical to how the Empire would forge their Empire. If you kill civilians and burn down all the important cities, no one's going to want to join you. So it was clearly lacking on the diplomatic side of things, as Total War often is. So summoning the Electric Counts through diplomatic missions and currency generated by doing things they like should be a much better alternative. But more than that, now each province will have a Rune Fang tied to it, and a new Regiment of Renown as well. And these aren't the crappy Sigmar's Blood Regiments we saw in the Grim and the Grave that are kind of like the loser nobodies nobody's ever heard of. To be fair, I like the Grim and the Grave. I think it's one of the weaker Lord packs, but the units there, while cool, are nowhere near as cool as the ones that hopefully we get in this update. And it seems like the ones that are coming 
RB heavy hitters, the iconic ones that everyone was kind of expecting when we first heard about ROR's back in Warhammer 1. So far, we have Carolberg Greatswords, Sterling Deathjacks, and Hawkland Long Rifles all but confirmed. A fourth regiment of renown, the Emperor's Wrath Steam Tank, has been pointed out by Guardian of Metal on the Warhammer forums. It was recently sent to the Engineers College in Altdorf for repairs, and it was then refitted into the Conqueror class configuration that we all know and love. It's essentially the same layout we already have for steam tanks. The main cannon and a steam gun. Only this one has armor plating that's blue and red, got a different color scheme, and I imagine a few different mechanics as well. It's a Midland tank that's been helping Boris Toddbringer clear out the Drak Wall to Beastmen for a while, and so that should probably be at least one of the Midland regiments of renown. But that leaves Averland, Nordland, Ostermark, Ostland, Talabekland, Sylvania, and Whistleland all unaccounted for. And that's only if there's only one unit associated with each province. Some could get none, some could get more than one, or a region like the Wasteland could get a secondary ROR from one of the other provinces. Averland could field the von Kragsberg Halberdiers, Altdorf could get their famous Altdorf Company of Honor, Midland could still get Tudigan Guard or Knights of the White Wolf, Wesenland might get Nolan Ironsides, Sylvania could get Black Guard of Moor, Ostermark the Deathhead Halberdiers, Talibine the Knights Panther because they have a chapter house there, and Ostland could get their famous Black Guard Greatswords or Knights of the Bull. There are a ton of regiments of renown that have not been pulled from the heraldry books that already exist or from the lore, and there are some great ones that CA could choose from, so whenever they choose, pick the right ones. I'm excited for it. There could honestly be some really good ROR's on their way, and it's the perfect update to finally throw in some of those famous knightly orders as well. I think it would be a huge missed opportunity if none of them made it in, and I would be a very sad panda if we missed out, so fingers crossed. But no matter what, seeing OG regiments like the Carolberg Greatswords, which are 100% explicitly confirmed, make the cut, warms my heart to its core. Nothing is more legit than seeing a feathery cap dude in Lance Connect style armor with that badass looking aesthetic just slicing through hordes of chaos trash. That's gonna be sweet. Now the Greenskins and Wood Elves are in the Drakwald and Wasteland in this coming update. Very likely a nod to the Forest of Lorlorn on the borders of Nordland. That's where the Wood Elves live. They have a secondary Azrai civilization there. I think they're called like Yohir or something like that. It's a different race of Wood Elves, but they're cousins of the Wood Elves we already know and love. And we're even getting a new battle map type as well, in the mountain passes at the borders of the Empire itself. Empire Forts, likely at Axebite Pass, which we know well from Helmgard and Vermintide 2, Blackfire Pass, and the other entrances to the Empire. They're going to function like the High Elf Gates with powerful garrisons and really cool battle maps to fight over, so I'm excited for that element as well. Images we've seen so far look pretty good. Some actual space to maneuver, some elevation that kind of makes it so it's not just some flat checkerboard style map. Makes them more appealing than the base game stages we've had at the very least. Don't know if I'd go so far as to say they're as good as Shogun 2s or Rome 2s or previous Total Wars, but we'll know when we actually get our hands on it. So I will definitely give those bad boys a shot as well. But overall, I think the Empire update is pretty exciting from what we've seen so far especially from a campaign perspective, and I think it's going to do a lot to liven up their playthroughs and give players more options. And it sets a fantastic precedent for the other races and mortal empires that we feel like have kind of fallen on hard times, the ones that have been left in the dust. If they're going to fix the empire, anyone else could be on the agenda next. Maybe the Greenskins, maybe the Wood Elves, maybe the Beastmen. Time will tell, but let me know what you think of all these improvements and additions coming on September 11th, and continue to check back over the next several weeks as I cover news and post content for The Hunter and The Beast, Nakai and Wolfheart, the free updates, and all the stuff that's coming to a computer near you. Peace.